Today is November 20th, 2015, and here in Berlin, I'm joined by Professor Renzo Molinari. Uh, thank you for joining me thank here and um, taking the time to talk to us. Professor Molinari was uh, the co-founder and principal of the Collège Osteopathique Française and became the principal of the European School of Osteopathy in 1996. He's also the co-founder of the World Osteopathic Health Organization, and he runs an institute and two clinics focusing on women's health in London. Renzo, what made you choose osteopathy as a career about 35 years ago? Forty years ago. Forty years ago. <laughs> no, forty years ago, because in fact osteopathy chose me. Uh, I was looking for um, manual medicine. I didn't know the name, but I was fascinated by, after reading a book uh, from Kessel, Hands of Miracle, Les Mains du Miracle. And um, I was, as a child, I was giving massage to my neighbors, to my mother who was suffering from her back. And then she referred me the neighbors. And when I was 12, I was giving massage to a few people. And I loved that, using my hands and feeling the tissues. And I wanted, after reading the book, I was fascinated by the fact that it was possible to treat people, uh, and really treat, not massage, but treat. And, um, and I started looking for a place where I could learn that, and I didn't find. Mm -hmm. And I was speaking to many people, and one day, it was in December, I remember. Uh, I had a phone call uh, from someone who told me, you know, you should come and see me because I think I'm doing what you're looking for. And I said, but who gave you my name? And he said, it's this old lady who I'm treating. And she told me that you are passionate about that and you should come and see me. And he was still that. Mm -hmm. And immediately I enrolled in a school and uh, and from that day, I was swallowed by osteopathy. Uh, the funny thing is that after that, this man became a student in medicine, mm -hmm. and he wanted me to join him, and I refused, telling him, no, my pathway is osteopathy, nothing else. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to be an osteopath. Okay. How would you compare becoming an osteopath back then to what people do nowadays to become an osteopath. Is it very different or would you say it's very similar? No, it's very different. Mm -hmm. Very different because, you know, especially being in France at the time, osteopathy was totally illegal. I remember the first day when we sat in the classroom, we had to raise our hand and say, I swear I will not divulge I'm studying osteopathy mm -hmm. until I graduate. And that in itself was giving us a great strength to fight for osteopathy, etc. So it was really vocational. I have the impression today when I see a lot of students that it's more by convenience, but then some of them evolve and really become vocational and, uh, and perpetuate uh, the philosophy of osteopathy. Mm. Now, most of the viewers will be familiar with the principles of osteopathy, but after all these years, how would you describe osteopathy if you are on a plane somewhere and someone talks to you and you have like a minute to explain it rather than all the principles and philosophies, what would you say is osteopathy? Just a few words. Mm -hmm. Just I say just a few words. I say that osteopathy is a manual medicine mm -hmm. that places the patient at the center and not the symptoms, not the disease, not the doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that, it's totally different from other therapeutic approaches. I, and I insist that osteopathy, it's the application of a philosophy. Mm -hmm. And for me, that is very important because nowadays, a lot of people are focusing on the application only and forget what is beyond. And uh, for me, you know, what is important, it's the old philosophy more than the application. 
some in osteopathy view the osteopathic uh, philosophy as a universal life principle, so to say. Would you apply that to your own life? Would you say this is what my whole life is about? Or would you say this is what osteopathy is about? I apply it to my life. I think, I think it's a universal theory of life. Okay. Yeah. Now, you have thought and taught osteopathy for many years, mm -hmm. and um, I would be interested in what you find hardest to communicate to people that are learning. Or I could also ask, uh, what do people find the hardest to understand in osteopathy? Is there anything particular? I think the most difficult thing, it's the multidimensional state of the patient. And the, the fact that, in fact, there are different levels where we can approach the patient system and, or the human being. And that is the most difficult because a, a lot of people place themselves at a certain level it can be high or lower, or it's not lower, or it's a different level, mm -hmm. and they don't move from there. Mm -hmm. And it takes a long time for them to be able to, mm -hmm. to change level. And I think it's very important to take that into account, because I believe that the healing process in the patients depends of further levels. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's what I meant before when I was talking about the application of osteopathy. Mm -hmm. The application is physical, mechanical, tissular, but the effect doesn't take place on that level. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's on another level, and that is difficult to communicate. Where is the level where the healing processes mm -hmm. can take place? Now, we are trying to facilitate that change in people, um, in the tissues, in the mind, and lifestyle. Yeah. Uh, do you ever get frustrated that people, patients, um, might not really want to change? It's their choice. It's their choice. In fact, you know, practitioners are different, patients are different. They have different requests. And um, of course, it will be better if we had only patients who really want to change, want to readapt to a new lifestyle, etc. But some of them have a very wrong understanding of what we do and remain on a very basic level. Mm -hmm. And um, in that case, I don't feel it's my job to try to change them because they have a specific request. If they want to engage in a travel of change, I'm really happy to try to go with them in this change. But very often, it's not their request. Okay. Now, what if you fail? How do you deal with failure? Because obviously we can't... I fail constantly. Exactly. How do you deal with it? I fail constantly. And <laughs> one of the big lessons of osteopathy for me, it's humility. <laughs> and it's not, it's, it's not written down as a principle. But if you, if you think about when you look at the basic principles, the fact that you place the patient at the center and not the practitioner means that you have to be humble, you have to rediscover humility, you have to be able to fail. Mm -hmm. and, um, and of course I fail, like everybody else, and it's sometimes very frustrating. And uh, I try to compensate that when sometimes I don't fail and I have a good result with a, a really a great satisfaction. Uh, but failure, it's difficult to accept, but it's part of the game. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have wrong interpretation, wrong understanding of the person, of the case, and sometimes wrong application also of techniques, and we have to accept that. Okay. Is there still anything new in osteopathy for you after all these years? Is there anything uh, or any part where you go, this is where I learn the most still? Yes. Miracle of life. The miracle of life. Explain that. Miracle of life. For me, you know, it's, it's, I said 40 years, but it's when I started studying. Mm -hmm. It's 37 years I'm practicing. And very often, at least one or twice every day in my practice, 
I feel I'm facing a real miracle uh, with an extraordinary dimension that I cannot comprehend, that I cannot perceive completely, but this, this power of life, this healing power that is there, available, and, and for me, I can only, only surrender in front of it because it's so beautiful and so powerful. Difficult to describe, difficult to comprehend, but there, present. Mm -hmm. Now, we are at the start of um, getting osteopathy set up as uh, courses of study, uh, university studies, uh, and do you feel that all these processes that you talked about can even be um, made science, so to say? <laughs> That's a good question, because it's, it's a point of reflection for me, mm -hmm. because I have been involved with education, with university studies, setting up courses, and I think that every time there is a great danger of losing what osteopathy really is. Um, we want to look scientific, we want to look acceptable, we want to be integrated in the medical community, and because of that we have a tendency to withdraw what osteopathy really is. And it's really difficult to make, for example, the scientific community accept the idea that osteopathy is not only scientific, but is artistic. Mm -hmm. And that, that, and again, it's multidimensional. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, you know, in 1938, Harrison Fryett gave a talk at the American Academy saying, uh, we are in danger of losing osteopathy in this country because osteopaths are concentrating on the application to become acceptable. Mm -hmm. And it's what's happening in every country. Okay. And, um, but at the same time, there is that, this danger. But at the same time, there, there are little groups who keep osteopathy alive. And I think that maybe to be integrated, it's acceptable to lose for one for a period a little bit of osteopathy as long as we keep the groups alive for postgraduate level or for mm -hmm. reflection. Right? And, uh, but I see in certain countries our osteopathy is evolving mm -hmm. and it's really concerning. Uh, but part Let's of stay history. with the positive countries. We okay. don't want to. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, but talk even bad. in the negative yeah. countries, yeah. even in the negative countries, at the same time, there, there are movements mm -hmm. to keep the philosophy alive, to keep the art alive, and, it, and they are becoming even more powerful. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not only negative. Yeah, but what I was trying to say is uh, you've traveled a lot, so is there a particular country or concept that you would say this seems to be really working in this country, because every country is different, but is there yeah. a certain country that you can mention or concept that they have? Well, it, it will look a little bit artificial, what I will say, but I have to say that being here this weekend, it's really nice because I'm really impressed. Because, you know, I, I think I, I gave the first lecture for the OSD with 14 students 15 years ago. And when I see 1,000 people here meeting and listening to people who don't present only the scientific side, but also the psycho-emotional aspect and, and the artistic aspect, it's really great. Mm -hmm. I think Germany is um, an unbelievable example because you know, when I started lecturing in Germany, there were 50 osteopaths. Suddenly, there were 5,000 students. Suddenly, there are 5,000 practitioners, and it's growing exponentially, uh, but keeping the quality. And, and that is really a good example. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not saying that because we are in Germany. Italy also is very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, Switzerland is interesting for different different mm, reasons, yes. uh, but I when you look at the way they structure the profession, it's uh, there is hope for the future. Now, since you've been part of the process in in England, do you feel 
the goal was reached or do you feel it went in a direction that you don't like? Because I'm obviously I thought, well, England was one of the first ones. Yes. So you already have 20 years of yes. seeing what's happening to the profession. 20 years of regulation. 20 years of regulation and nobody knows what osteopathy is. Okay. The doctors don't are unable to say mm. what osteopathy is. The patients have completely different understanding mm. and even osteopaths. Mm. And um, I don't want to be negative, but um, when I see what's ha what happened to our profession in England, uh, it's a bit disheartening because we were regulated 20 years ago. I moved to England because I thought that is the country where osteopathy will flourish. And in fact, osteopaths fell asleep. Mm. And, uh, and I have the impression when I'm in England that half of the population, half the practitioners, have reduced osteopathy to a minimal manipulative mm. technique without thinking further. But at the same time, there are groups that are strengthening now and react, look at the philosophy, look at the principle, and, and reviving what osteopathy is. So I think there are waves, you know, there are, yeah. it's oscillations. And, yeah. uh, but I still believe that osteopathy is part of the third millennium medicine. Mm -hmm. mm. Because we are on the brink of uh, a revolution in medicine, a necessary revolution. Mm -hmm. You know, we are at the end of the life of antibiotics. We. Uh, there was the Macrobioma project that demonstrated the importance of bacteria, etc. And medicine has to change. Medicine has to have to bring back the patient at the center mm -hmm. or at the top. And uh, if we don't do that, we are. It's the Prime Minister of England announced a few months ago that we are in danger in 2020 to have 80, 200,000 people dying because of infections because the, anti uh, the, the bacteria are becoming resistant. It's necessary to change uh, medicine, it's necessary to integrate our philosophy in medicine, and, uh, and I think if we are good enough, we will be there. Okay. And finally, maybe a word, for, a word of advice for students that are new to osteopathy? Believe. Mm -hmm. But be objective, try to be, believe, be objective, and be humble. Mm -hmm. And don't be afraid to fail and to make mistakes. And as you are a student, you are allowed to make mistakes. And, and it's through mistakes that you can learn a lot. Mm -hmm. But really try to promote true osteopathy. Okay. And maybe it's different advice for those that have been uh, in osteopathy for a few years, anything to expound on that? Same thing, be humble. Okay. Be humble, be true to yourself, be true to osteopathy, and don't reject the, f the founder and the early osteopath because they carry a fantastic message. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and be true to yourself. Good. Well, thank you very much for thank your time. You. And um, all the best for the future. Thank you. And thank you very much for watching.